Hello, welcome to Voices of Black Opera. My name is Farah Mohamud. I am the director and co-founder of Upress. Upress is a social enterprise based in London. We believe in the power of words and stories to change lives for the better. And we use creative arts, media, and training to empower community members and young people to find their voice and be heard. This is a special event that we're hosting tonight in collaboration with Paddington Central, who we have worked with for the last two years. We've done incredible work, and this is probably one of our proudest events that we're doing this month during Black History Month. And tonight we're joined by a special guest, Kathy Hassan. Kathy is a London-based photographer, filmmaker, producer, and a creative director with a language degree, not only in one language, but in three, French, Italian, and Spanish. She graduated from the University of London and went on to study photography and film, uncovering a rich visual language that became part of her trademark. She also runs a production company called Burgrade Productions and Films. So let's give a warm welcome to Kathy Hassan. Kathy, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Farah. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, Kathy, I had a chance to watch over Voices of Black Opera, powerful, powerful documentary film. I want to know a little bit more about the film and the stories behind it. But before we dive into that, I want to know a little bit more about Kathy. So, Kathy, tell us a little bit something interesting about you as a filmmaker and as a photographer and as overall as a creative that most people don't know about you. That's always a tricky question because you don't want to give too many secrets away. But I would say um, I'm really passionate about storytelling and particularly I'm passionate about the millions of stories that are within our community and further afield that uh, we don't get to see. I'm really, really, really committed to amplifying those voices. I would say that would be one of the main, main messages I'd like to send uh, through my work. Amazing, amazing. And it, it clearly speaks for your work as well. And that's something that resonates with us as well because we're champion for storytelling and really representing those community members that don't have a voice. I'd be interested to know what was inspiration, what was the spark that, you know, got you to create this film? So um, I think first, just kind of um, picking up from when you say champion, champion in these voices. Mm. I think what's quite nice about this event and working with yourselves, you press, is to come together and uh, put the light, shine the focus on the stories that we don't normally hear about. So going back to Voices of Black Opera, um, I was actually looking through my emails, which is great because you really have a trail. I mean, this is going back to over eight years now. I did it eight years ago. Mm. And um, I think I saw something online and I approached an organization called the BBCF, which is the Black British Classical Foundation. And um, quite often you find with a lot of these organizations, they're absolutely receptive to getting involved in projects that involves promoting them and shining, you know, very positive light on the work they're doing. And often you'll find that, you know, it's a struggle, no matter how big the organization is or how much visibility it is, mm. quite often within our community, there is still a struggle on resources. Mm. So for me, and also for that organization, it was just a great marriage because I was gonna bring my skills and be able to uh, film something for them that would help enable them to market what they're trying to do out there and promote these beautiful voices. So, um, I one day went with a crew, myself, a camera guy, and we went to a rehearsal that they did in a place. It was a basement, I believe, or part basement, but it was a cafe restaurant. And they did a rehearsal, which was just absolutely amazing. And then following that, I then went to film them, film them in a church in the West End. Right. And that's how I managed to put together and get these wonderful stories and just being able to see behind the scenes um, and how these uh, just robust, beautiful, big voices come together within this church and um, deliver such a beautiful, such beautiful performances. Amazing, yeah. And it, it, the work itself it speaks for itself. And what captured like my attention straight away is the unique voices that you captured through that throughout the whole documentary film. And it was such quite an array of voices and, and different experiences and journeys as well. I'd be interested to know, like, if you had to choose one story out of the different interviews you captured that you'd focus on, what would it be and why? Do you know, I've never really looked at it that way because I think they've all got very, very different stories. I mean, one of the things about us as a community, um, and that by that I mean people from the African and the Caribbean diaspora um, and wider, is that we tend to be seen as kind of monolithic, so just one voice. Mm. Um, and I think that's what you picked up. Everyone has a different journey, a different story different experience. It's a whole multitude of different beautiful collections of experience. So I wouldn't say there's one particular one that I came away and thought I would like to expand more into that. Yeah. 
Very interesting. Thank you for that, Kat. And also, I'd be interested to pick your brain a little bit more, especially, you know, as we celebrate Black History Month and all around voice representation and the diversity of, you know, UK and Britain. How important, I would interest to hear your thoughts, is how important is accurate representations of those community members? Like in this case, we're looking at black operas that are sometimes not seen or heard. I think, I think I'm, I'm not so sure I'd go for the word accurate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to censor dialogue, but I think authentic is probably what I would want to put out there, which is, um, you know, this is their space. It's mm -hmm. a platform for them to be able to tell the stories. They are the owners, the creators of their story. Mm -hmm. So I think it's very important. Uh, we don't get a lot of that quite often. The stories are taken and they're either sensationalized, bastardized, denigrated, or just twisted to fall, uh, to fall in place with certain narratives, mm. uh, whether they're political, social, cultural narratives. And quite often they can eventually in time, not necessarily just at that point, but hinder impact on the authenticity of the story. So for me, it is also more than anything else about authenticity. Amazing, amazing. And you're, so you're from West London, isn't it? You're from yeah. West London. I, w I was born in uh, Porto, just off Portobello Road, so I am uh, Notting Hill. Crazy. And I'd be interested to hear your journey uh, coming up as a filmmaker, as a creative, and, you know, and what advice would you give to upcoming young filmmakers and creatives and individuals that want to capture those unique voices from their communities? What advice would you give them? I think most important is to, to really be honest with yourself as to why you go into filmmaking, you know. Um, if you're looking for a quick buck, it's going to be very difficult. It's a long journey. If you're looking for fame, you need to kind of really reevaluate that. If you're looking to, I mean, first and foremost, it's working with people, it's collaborations, which is just wonderful because it's a great journey. You get to meet all types of people, wonderful, friendly, very giving, some real salty individuals as well, but you stay away from them, you get to <laughs> identify them and you move on. Um, I think really study your craft, and I know it sounds kind of cliche, but the technology changes all the time, so don't let the technology stop you. There, there are some fundamentals like storytelling, and that is, you know, get out there, watch as much as you can, and look at different traditions of storytelling in different communities, different cultures. Um, but there's some basic fundamentals, um, and one of them is don't be afraid to ask questions. I think that's, be curious curious about what you want to do. And also allow yourself to fail. Mm. I mean, all great work has come from failure. It's, sure. it's impossible to, um, and don't feel intimidated. Um, and if you have an idea, research. Research is so important. Um, and through that, you get to identify what works and what doesn't. Mm. The technology is cheaper now. So, you know, just with your uh, mobile phone, you can put together a really interesting story and get to develop an audience, you know, um, go out there um, and collaborate. Through collaborating, you'll learn, you'll come across some great stories some great angles and also research on the greats, those who come before us. And this is across the board, whether it's filmmakers in uh, Bangladesh, India, China, France, Italy, Nigeria, South Africa, Burkina Faso, get out there and you'll see that it's just so much beautiful stuff to be inspired by. Amazing. Thank you, Cathy. Very Thank insightful you. and appreciate advice as well. So all the young people and all aspiring creatives out there, take a, take a note of Cathy's journey and incredible advice as well. Also, before we screen the actual documentary film, um, what can you tell our audience, what can they expect in the film tonight? I think you're going to hear some amazing voices. Um, I think more so um, at this given time, in this time and place and with what's going on in the world and uh, the world is quite sick. It's uh, the internet to be able to do something like this is really important and to understand that music is such a huge unifier. It's probably the biggest. We all connect with music in some shape or form. And it's wonderful to be able to bring this to people. And through music, there are people who are going to learn about others and their experiences, their challenges, and also hopefully keep supporting. I think it's really important. Support in any way that you can, in kind, financially, spread the news. Just keep spreading news about what's going on in our community, which you might not know about, even though you do live in a community or you live in the fringes and you live elsewhere. But I think just carry on and be part of that movement that amplifies the voices and celebrates everything that we all collectively do. I think that would be it. 
Amazing. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Yeah, along with Kathy's uh, powerful Voices of Black Opera documentary film screening tonight, we also have a special performance by Juan, who's going to be performing tonight and will give you a bit more information. But I don't want to reveal too much because I want you to fully experience it and enjoy it. And also, I want to take this moment to thank our incredible, incredible team that made these Black History Month events possible this month. Start with, I want to thank our filmmaker and our creative freelancer, Chris, behind the camera, who's doing incredible work. Along with Chris, we also have Amando, who's been with us as well and doing incredible work behind the scenes. Along the way, we had Sagal, who did the interview with Charlie Phillips. If you haven't seen a video yet on the, the screening, make sure you click on it and watch and catch up on the last interview we did. Powerful, powerful piece. Also want to thank Samir, Anna, Liv, the Upress family and community for always believing in us and supporting us. I also want to thank Charlie, Juan, and Kathy for making this collaboration possible and bring this together. And lastly, I want to thank the Paddington Central team, specifically Jody and Fasnara, for working with us to make sure everything runs smoothly and to bring these events to you tonight as well. So to find out more information about Upress and what we do, visit upress.org.uk. Kathy, where could they find out a bit more information about you and your work? So um, it's Bureau Grande Films, um, which you can find on YouTube, Bureau Grande Films Production as a company. But Bureau Grande Films, pretty much, uh, you Google that and you should see quite a lot of content and a uh, couple of docs that are currently in production and they will be screened next year at some point as well. And I do have imminently a documentary on the African roots of dance in Cuba. So I'll be uh, dropping some content around that. Amazing, amazing. Looking forward to that. So yeah, so I hope you enjoy the, the screening coming up and the performance by Juwan. Thank you again for joining us tonight and we look forward to connecting with you soon. Take care. It is a myth to say that black British people have no appetite for classical music. Contrary to popular belief, black Britain can do high art, and not just popular. Black operatic singers are virtually unheard of. When we think of a tenor today, we name Russell Watson or Placido Domingo. Yet only several decades ago, the world's most recognized black man was the American singer, actor, political activist and tenor Paul Robeson. People of African descent have long been involved in classical music as creators, interpreters and performers. A number of renowned singers from William Warfield to Jesse Norman have made their mark in the world of opera. However, black artists singing opera still tend to be discriminated against. I think so many casting directors within opera, they sort of think, well, they don't have to do anything about the black actor, the black opera singer, because they, I think they think they don't exist. But we thought if we actually were to highlight that there is talent, there is uh, a depth and wealth of talent, they can't actually ignore it. For me to be an opera singer was quite a difficult journey for me, I have to say. Um, it's not something that was, I wouldn't say respected, but more so known. It's that sense of um, knowing about it and appreciating it in our community. Who, who is in their right mind as a black person could be an opera singer? I was very lucky because I grew up in Trinidad in the West Indies 
and I was exposed to classical music from a very early age because my parents, they were both teachers, head teachers, and we had lots of influences. We had jazz playing in the house, we had opera playing in the house, radio, all sorts of things. But also, um, there was an unwritten rule. You could be whatever you wanted to be, you could be whoever you wanted to be. And we, growing up in that kind of atmosphere, you just learned and just aimed for whatever you wanted to be. I mean, my parents themselves, when I told them I wanted to do opera, they said, nah, no way. <laughs> they actually said no. But after a while, they realized you're really serious about it. Because I had to show that I was serious about it. I think it was more sort of self-discovery. Only until that I was really sure that this is the path that I wanted to be on. This is what I really want to be doing. This is what I want to be doing. Yeah, I want to be an opera singer. I got into opera uh, during university. Um, I joined a choral society and the conductor of the choral society decided um, I should audition. And I just auditioned and I had such a good time doing the opera. Um, I started looking for more opera things to do and it sort of snowballed from there. And then I went to music college and now I'm a professional. I've done musicals, I was in a pop band. But I love opera because of the challenge that it gives, gives me with the actual singing, the languages, having to sing in French, German, Italian, and even Russian sometimes. Uh, I love that about it. That it, 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 it thrills me. It thrills me. What I love about opera is it's like an escape. You can delve into a character and be lost. And it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing escape. And I can't believe that you get paid to play for a couple of hours every night. It's amazing. To the woman on the street or the man in the boardroom who says, why don't black people like opera? As you can see, there's plenty of enthusiasm here. I think the Black British Classical Foundation exists because um, it brings this type, this genre of music to um, people who may be otherwise not have um, been involved. And um, just to um, introduce the music to let them see that it's not only for the elite, but for the, the man on the street, or for everyone, really. I think opera has always been perceived as a rich man's game, but I think it's such a beautiful cultural experience that it's beginning to change, and I think Voice of Black Opera is beginning to change that misconception, that myth. Um, we are an inclusive society. We want everybody to enjoy the same sort of things, and there's an enormous amount of musical talent and dramatic, dr dramatic talent in our minority communities. Black people have so much to give to this art form, but they're not going to do it unless they know more about it, unless they engage. People coming to our organisation and coming to our concerts are predominantly black. Right tonight, it's about, what, 95% black. Now, that's just because they know they are welcomed. They know that we've actually made an effort to find them, to bring them in. At the Royal Opera House, they don't care. I think all the established, they don't particularly care because at the end of the day, it's money. I don't suppose they perceive black folk as having money or even want to spend money on such a thing. But uh, they miss the point. It's not that they don't want to spend, they don't want to come. It's that they're not made to feel welcome. That's just the problem. The time has now arrived for a change in that perception. These types of events illustrate how critical it is to support and promote programs that demystify opera by making it accessible to as wide an audience as possible. Face now with the inevitable realities of the current cultural landscape, the digital era, and the evolving nature of art consumption, opera must evolve 
and find new dynamic ways to appeal to audiences that consume music and entertainment in challenging and eclectic ways. Driven by the desire to keep operatic music in all communities and schools, the BBCF works tirelessly in presenting excellence among all classical singers and provides a platform that encourages and embraces new audiences. More and more so, opera is beginning to detach itself away from the mainstream community, you know, mainstream education. And, you know, children aren't really exposed to music and singing in general. So I'm always passionate about bringing, you know, that sort of medium into schools. And I do that. I do that as a workshop leader and I go around to various schools bringing my art form. It's very, very important because it's uh, actually trying to bring the youngsters through to understand exactly um, what uh, is open to them in terms of operatic and other forms of, uh, of, of, of songs rather than just the, the hip hop or the garage, etc. I took half a dozen black youngsters to the Albert Hall this year and everyone said they won't come or they won't stay the course and I can assure you they thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, I just came here because I love opera and I like classical music a lot. It made me feel quite emotional to see how much talent there is in the black community and how it can be shown through operas. So many of the great classical singers and musicians have actually their origins. Uh, in uh, the ethnic minority community. Uh, so it's what the black community can offer to classical music, but also what classical music and classical training can offer the young black uh, musician, the young black singer. So people, so younger people, young generation get into it and just enjoy it because it's not really out in the market as much as it's needed to be really. Most of them will only perform in circles and to audiences that already appreciate the genre of music and to expose it to a broader audience to, you know, to see the wealth of talent that we have that can take on, tackle and master such amazing music is truly inspirational.
The very essence of opera's survival as an engaging art form lies in its ability to recognize, embrace, and support diversity. It's a wonderful thing that we have oh, uh, such a marvelous array of fantastic opera singers in the midst of Mayfair doing their thing, if you know what I mean. It's, it's, it's great to raise the awareness of black, opera, black British opera singers. We've had fantastic divas like Leontine Price, uh, Kathleen Battle, um, we have had Simon Estes, we've had Willard White, we've had George Shirley, we have Martina Arroyo. A lot of these people are not British born or British trained. I consider myself a British singer because I'm British trained. And all these people here are British trained and, and British born as well. We need to expose these people and there are very many of them singing at very high levels of, of um, the art in and around the world and we don't know them enough in this country, unfortunately. I think this competition is brilliant because it gives a, a, a platform for young black artists and Asian artists from ethnic minorities to perform um, on a really big scale, so it's great. You know, the arts is for all. The arts transforms, it edita entertains, it educates, it inspires. And that, is for, and that is for everybody, it's across the board. And we have talent in our communities that can do that, but they don't have the platform to be exposed you know, to be appreciated, and if it takes something like the Black Classical, um, Black British Classical Foundation to do that, then so be it. Our aim is that we should actually end up a competition very much like uh, Cardiff Singer of the World. On the other hand, we should be working to a point when we don't have to have a competition because an, an, an opera singer will be an opera singer regardless through its colour. But at the moment, you still have to fight that battle to say that we are singers, we happen to be black, but we can still perform to the highest level and we should be given the opportunities and the roles. Hello, my name is Juan Gungbe. Welcome to Paddington Central's Black History Month celebration. I'm going to perform some songs for you today, and the first one is by Ignatius Sancho, and it's called Anna Crayon Ode No. 13. treasure God could give man a longer time to live I'd employ the utmost care still to keep and still to spare and when death approached would say take thy fee and go away take thy fee Take thy fee, take thy fee, and go away. The 
but his riches cannot save mortals from the gloomy grave. Why should I myself deceive, vainly sigh and vainly grieve? Death will surely be my lot, whether I am rich or not, whether I, whether I, whether I am rich or not. Give me freely while I live, generous wine in plenty give. Serving joys my life to cheer, beauty kind and friends sincere. Happy will I ever find friends sincere and beauty kind. Friends sincere, friends sincere, friends sincere and beauty kind. Ignatius Sancho was the first black composer to ever have his music published. He was born in, uh, on a slave ship, but lived in London in the 18th century between like the 1730s and 1780s. His childhood was, childhood was sad because he was living with, as a slave, working for three sisters who treated him badly. He was then taken under the wing of a duke and under that duke's wing, he was given access to musical education and, other, and literacy and other things. And then he became, well, he flourished and became, um, well, different to many others and was lionised in London society as a special black person. And the abolitionists of that time, campaigning against slavery, um, took Ignatius Sancho and made him a symbol of the humanity of black people shared with everyone else. He also made friends with David Garrick, who was a renowned Shakespearean actor at that point in time, who wrote a series of poems in praise of William Shakespeare. And one of those was called Sweetest Bard, which Ignatius Sancho set to music. And so here is Sweetest Bard. Thing 
together sing his praise, all uniting sing his praise, all uniting sing his praise. And so, the next song I'm going to sing for you is called Deep River. It's an African-American spiritual. And the African-American spirituals are traditional songs that became well known. They emerged from the era of slavery in the United States of America. The Fisk Jubilee Singers were a group of university students who were the first to make these songs well known through traveling around in the, in the USA and also other countries performing the songs. Um, so a bit further down the line, in the early to mid 20th century, classical singers such as Marian Anderson, who was a, a contralto, um, included Negro spirituals or African American spirituals in her repertoire um, in concerts. And then Paul Robeson, who was well known as an actor as well as singer and activist, um, also included this particular song in his repertoire. So here is Deep River. This last song is called Uloyi Momo, which from Yoruba translates to mean the purveyor of the sweetest honey. It came from a piece that I composed, um, a show called Threshold, which was inspired by the Palm Wine Drinker. The Palm Wine Drinker was a novel by Amos Tutuola. Amos Tutuola was one of the earliest African authors to become internationally renowned. And in this particular instance, what's happening is there's a palm wine tapper whose wife has departed to the spirit world. Her name is Oloyi Momo, and the palm wine tapper is pining for her to return from the spirit world. Do 
If you would like to hear more of my music, you can visit my website or you can check out my YouTube channels. Thank you for joining us in our Black History Month celebrations at Paddington Central. <laughs>